morning and welcome to another episode of Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and we're glad you could join us for today's program. We're going to take a look at labels on pesticide products, we'll also focus on All America's Selection Seeds, and we're going to hear about Buy Fresh, Buy Local here in Lincoln. To start our show today, we're going to look at color. In the middle of the cold gray winter, it is so refreshing to see those splashes of color. We took our cameras to the garden center to show you some very creative possibilities. The gray days of winter make most of us long for anything in color, and there's really nothing like walking into a garden center that has just gotten in a great supply of all of this incredible beauty. The majority of the plants that we're looking at are not going to be happy living in the landscape, but of course we don't want them to live in the landscape in the winter months anyway. You want them on your desk, you want them on your kitchen table, and you want to just enjoy what you've got for the time that you've got it. So let's take a look at a handful of the different plants that are available, starting with one of the ones that people think is a shrub, and that would be azaleas. We have three of them in complete beautiful bloom right now. Depending on what species this is, those could potentially go outside into the landscape in a pampered location and then live to sing their song another day. Then we have these incredibly beautiful cyclamens with those back swept petals, beautiful, beautiful marbled foliage in tiny pots. They'll flower for a fairly long time. Make sure you pay attention to the watering requirements. Give them indirect light, but not too much, and just enjoy that sort of up in the air attitude that cyclamens have. Then we have cineraria, which is this bright-eyed, bushy-tailed plant in these beautiful colors with sort of that perfect white eye around the center of each bloom in sort of a mounded or cushiony sort of an appearance. Beautiful, beautiful colors for use against those gray skies. As if those first three choices weren't enough, we have several other plants that can bring you that beautiful color in your cool home. These, these plants really do like it a little bit cooler in the winter, so unless you've cranked your heat all the way up, you're going to keep their flowering for a lot longer if you do keep it a bit cool. So if you look at this beautiful combination, we have primrose to start with, and just look at that. We have what's called a picotty edge around, the, around these petals on this one, and then that star-shaped yellow center teeny weeny little plant and you could put three or four of those on your kitchen table or on your dining room table. Of course beautiful Gerbera daisies that actually come in plant form as well as as a cut flower. Long season and just that perky daisy-like flower. We have Kalanchoe which is reminds people of a succulent because it's got those big fleshy leaves, comes in multiple different colors and this is actually a plant that does like a bit of water, even though it looks like it uh, is really related to a sedum. And then we have the begonias, the beautiful Riger begonias, multiple sizes of pots. They're almost a rosebud appearance for the flowers, big fleshy stem. These are plants that can go into the garden, into a container if you want them to. They're not going to be really happy sitting out in the landscape and being neglected. And then, of course, the miniature roses. Miniature roses are real roses. They're just in a little tiny package. These are beautiful in the home or on your office counter or in the break room, as long as they get a bit more light. And then of course you can take those outside and put them in the garden. So all of this incredible, beautiful in your face color to offset that gray and then enjoy that for all the remaining winter months. All that color can really brighten up even the most dreary setting, and it's a good reminder of the amazing choices you have for the upcoming growing season. There are so many great color combinations and textures for you to try, and you should take some time, visit your local garden center, get creative. For today's landscape lesson, we're going to turn your attention to seeds. We're going to take a look at some of the seed selections that we're going to grow in the backyard farmer garden this season, and because we are a display garden, Lots of these seeds come from the All-America selections. Almost every year we talk about growing seeds, starting seeds from scratch, and, and all of those really cool new plants that are coming out that might be available to gardeners. 
And of course, in the backyard farmer garden, we are an All-America display garden, not a trial garden. So we have those All-America selection winners. So I thought we'd talk today about the All-America selections. And of course, you can also talk to John Porter, who has the All-America trial garden in Omaha. And Sarah Browning does a lot of uh, talking about All-America selections and those plants for your landscape as well. But here's the deal. Our, our master gardeners are the ones who start our seeds. And I think this is a really neat idea that they've done this year. Maybe they've done it in the past and we just haven't paid much attention to it. But they have a huge spreadsheet of everything that they think they're going to grow. They have all of the information about it, the name, the selection, the source, whether it's edible or not, the plant information sheet, the sun exposure, the height, the spacing, the suggested sowing date, and the date sown. So they can keep all of this information and track it from year to year. And of course, keeping those records is something we've talked about on the show as well. If you keep the records, you know what worked and what failed. The All-America selection process is one that is national and then it's regional. And as a display garden, we do get access to those seeds perhaps a bit sooner than others do. We grow them, we see whether they work for us. And the national winners and the regional winners are not necessarily the same thing because of the process used. And of course, just because it is an All-America selection doesn't mean it's going to want to grow in Nebraska. So the interesting thing for you to think about if you want to try these in your own home landscape is take a look first at whether it has worked for us in our garden or whether it has worked in the trial garden or whether you have other friends and gardeners who have had good experience with it. So just a couple of uh, comments on a couple of the 2020s coming out. There is a watermelon coming out that is Mambo and our master gardeners are thinking they're gonna sow this late. April 26th, of course, watermelon likes it warm so they shouldn't, they shouldn't sow it any earlier than that. Uh, but they're going to sow them and start them inside and then move them out. And it's, a, it's one that is 11-pound uh, watermelon. So we're not talking about one of those 65-pound moon and stars that we grew a few years ago. But that's a new 2020. There's a cucumber called green light that is a direct sow. And these are climbers with little tiny fruits on them. So if, if you think about cucumbers and what people love, I, you know, a lot of us really like those little one bite crunchers instead of the big long ones. And of course, tomatoes are always a hot item, way too hot in some instances in terms of the numbers of them. But there is a national winner called Solano, which is a patio grape type uh, grown with some support. And that will be a really great one to watch as well. The list of the uh, All-America selections that are 2020s is pretty long. And one of the things that you can do if you want to take a look at it is just go to their website. You can search by 2020. You can go through the list from the very beginning of All-America selections. You can also search by region, which is the heartland. And again, knowing that we are in a very different growing situation than say Iowa or South Dakota or Missouri, gives you a little bit better idea of some of the opportunities and the possibilities just looking at All-America selections. Once again, if you'd like to see a listing of all the All-America selections, you can go to the website on your screen. We're always encouraging you to be creative and try new things, and All-America selections is a great place to start because they are proven to thrive in our environment, so check them out today. For this week's interview, we're going to hear about a great program that promotes locally grown food. Buy Fresh, Buy Local program helps farmers, ranchers, and producers help their communities raise awareness about the value of locally grown food. I'm really pleased to be talking today to Skylar Falter, who is the chair, the runner, coordinator. the coordinator of a program called Buy Fresh by Local. Skylar, it's been around for a while and you've been around for longer than I thought you had, but not very long. So talk about the program and what it's all about and what excites you about it. Yeah, thank you Kim for having us on. So um, I'm the program coordinator for Buy Fresh by Local Nebraska. We started about 13 years ago. Um, and it was, you know, just through a need of wanting to create more visibility around local foods in the state. So a group of 
um, farmers and people invested in wanting to promote local foods got together and created this program. And so essentially we are a member-based um, promotion, education, and marketing program for local foods. We're where you find your farmer, we're where you find recipes that use a lot of seasonal Nebraska-grown ingredients. Um, we, we are um, there to find farmers markets in your areas. Very diverse you know, range of things that we do. So the program has grown and you are statewide? Yes, we are statewide. Um, we are still primarily, you know, a lot of our members are in the Lincoln Omaha markets just because of population right. and demand there, but we would love, we are definitely statewide and we wanna hear and know about all the people across the state that are doing, you know, interesting things when it comes to local foods. So let's say I wanted to be a member and, and said, I've got this product how do I tell you about it? And then what do you do about it? Because you brought some products with you. Yeah, so certainly, so we have, our website is buylocalnebraska.org. Um, and we are, if you were interested in joining, I would recommend going on that website. There's a page about membership. Uh, you can read about um, who our current members are, and you can also see the steps to join. You can join online. We kind of do an annual membership drive um, to publish one of our main promotion pieces, which is the Local Food Guide of Nebraska. And so this is one of our uh, featured uh, publications that people know us from this, this guide, but we also have an online food guide to search um, products. And so yeah, on my way over here, I just stopped at um, Open Harvest Grocery in Lincoln, who's also one of our members, to see like what kind of local stuff can I find today? Um, and so I picked up some mushrooms, uh, microgreens from Robinette Farms. This is from Nebraska Mushroom in Grand Island. Um, so really our membership is you know, in lots of different locations. We have some value added products. Um, and so just kind of showing, you know, showcasing our members is what we like to do. We have events, we have um, different promotion pieces that we run, uh, ways for people to learn more about how their food is grown. So you talked a little bit off air about a something of the month. Yes. What is, what is that? <laughs> yeah, so another thing we do is, um, is we work with um, trying to get more local foods in school meals, trying to get fresh, healthy foods there. And so um, with the Nebraska Department of Education, Buy Fresh, Buy Local has created a program called Harvest of the Month which features a different Nebraska grown uh, vegetable or fruit um, once a month and tries to encourage you know, the food service there to make, you know, make sweet potato chips or something they maybe haven't done in the past. Um, branch out a little bit and try to get kids sampling these things that can grow pretty easily here. Which is really a great connection because you know, our experience with it has been if you can get the children to want it, the parents might actually eat it yes. as well, or at least accept it on the table. That's true. So you also mentioned that there's perhaps something going on in April that you do, or one of your events. What What is that? Yeah, so we, um, in April, we'll be hosting a local food showcase in Lincoln, and that will be near the Jane um, Snyder Trail Center. Mm -hmm. And we, it's just kind of like a celebration, like a pre-season, you know, pre-farmer's market celebration for anyone who loves food. We will have samples that are made with local ingredients and we have music um, it's just kind of a fun time uh, gathering before the farmers markets really get going perfect so one of the things we also talked about Skylar is this is not just an April to August sort of an experience talk a little bit about that and some of the either more unusual foods or the ones that you just know don't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think one misconception people have is when the farmers markets are done in October or September, you know, I there's nothing else to find local. Um, but really we have members, Buy Fresh by Local members that are growing 365 days a year. And so, you know, obviously your meats, your eggs and dairy are still available, but there's mm -hmm. still fresh greens. I'm in a CSA right now. Uh, for Robinette Farms that goes through the winter and we have fresh turnip greens and cabbage and um, there's also the value added products like elderberry syrup you know we're thinking about immunity and things like that um, it's good to elderberries grow really well here um, and there's also a lot of I think need for more fruit production in in our state and so like we were mentioning people maybe are want blueberries and cranberries or more familiar fruits but some of the things that grow really well here um, service berries gooseberries 
uh, choke cherries. You know, there's just other things to explore um, in our state, and the local farmers are the ones that are starting that initiative. Which is all great information, you know, teaching edible landscapes or talking about it on Backyard Farmer to be able to say, all right, you want a new plant in your landscape or you want to actually grow your own food or buy it from somebody who has for the freshness, the quality, all of the reasons to do it is really what you're all about. Is that yeah, that's much a summary? Yeah, that's true. And I should say, like, you know, when I say farmer, I think if you're growing, you have a house and you're growing food that you eat in, in your backyard, that counts. You know, we need more people growing food, whether they're selling it or not. And urban farming is becoming more popular and, um, it's, it's just a great way to engage more with your food and get the, the best health and best quality. Perfect, and this is the time of year to start thinking about that, buy those seeds, yeah. think about those plants. If you are a local farmer and you don't know anything about this, go online and look for it, and we are certain to have Skylar and what she's doing back on the air on Backyard Farmer when we start our season. Thank you, Skylar. Thanks, Kim. Of course, we want our viewers to grow their own food in their backyard gardens, but if that's not possible, you can still enjoy fantastic vegetables and other food items that have been grown locally throughout the state. It's time for us to hear from our Backyard Farmer panel to answer some of your frequently asked questions. And even though Backyard Farmer isn't on the air right now, you can send us an email. That address is byf at unl.edu. Powdery mildew is a very common problem in Nebraska. Now whether or not it's significant can really depend on a few different factors. One of the big factors will be the, age, the overall age of the plant. On our more established plants, we tend not to have a lot of issues with powdery mildew. Yes, we'll get some of that white fungal growth on the top of the leaves and maybe some early defoliation, but generally, these more established plants are able to recover primarily due to the energy reserves that are in, the, in, their, in their stem and in the root system. Now, if you have repeated seasons of this early defoliation, now that may, that, now that may lead to some overall decline of the plant and control may be necessary. Another time when powdery mildew can cause um, significant issues is if you have very, very new plantings or young plants. And these new plantings and young plants tend not to have the energy reserves that some of our more established plants do. And so they are much more susceptible to this early defoliation that can be caused by powdery mildew. Now, when you talk about controlling powdery mildew, some of our cultural controls can be very, very effective. And some of the best things that we can do are, will really be to one, make sure that we properly space our plants, that we're not overcrowding things. The more space between the plants, the more airflow through the canopy, and we'll, that will reduce the, the leaf wetness period that's needed for powdery mildew to infect. Another thing that we can do to control powdery mildew is to, is to remove a lot of the infected leaves as soon as we start to see the, those white patches develop. Again, those white patches are the fungal mycelia that will spread with any rain splash onto other healthy plants. A third thing that really helps control powdery mildew is really watering at the base of the plants. And so watering the soil and not doing that overhead irrigation that we may tend to do, especially when we're feeling a little bit lazy about um, watering the garden. That overhead irrigation can splash, the, can splash the fungus onto nearby plants, resulting in more infection. Now, if you do have a high value crop and you are, are looking for a, a chemical control option, there are some protectant fungicides that can be used. Um, however, copper, does work pretty well in, air, in areas that, have, that, that have, um, have a repeated history of powdery mildew infection. So when we talk about cutting back our perennials, a lot of the perennials we're gonna let stand throughout the winter. That goes for our ornamental grasses, that's gonna go for our asparagus, that's gonna go for just about most of the plant material we have. The reason we're gonna let them stand throughout the winter is they allow for winter interest. So this allows different birds and other wildlife to use that area. It also gives a little bit of break up from the white snow if we actually have snow this winter. Um, another thing that it does is it actually allows the snow to stay off of the crown of the plant. 
which if we cut back that perennial, that snow can just sit on top of the crown of the plant and then we can have different fungal issues uh, down the road. So by leaving those stems up, we allow that snow to not sit on the crown of that plant. So we're gonna leave those plants up as long as we possibly can up until the point that they start to actively grow. We don't wanna try to prune them off too early because what we're gonna see then is then for one, we don't know what winter kill we're gonna have. If we prune a portion of that plant off too early and then we have a cold snap, what we can see is we can see death in those pruning cuts going deeper down. So instead of cutting off two inches like you had intended, now we're having to cut off an additional two inches due to the freeze damage. So we wanna leave that plant up there and we want to try to avoid pruning too much. This is especially true when we talk about our roses. So roses, we wanna hold off pruning as long as we possibly can, unless we're putting it underneath a rose cone for winter, uh, winter care and for winter mulch. Otherwise, we wanna hold off and we don't wanna prune those roses unless they really need the pruning when we look at later on into May. A lot of the other perennials like our suffrutescence, like our butterfly bush, our um, Caryopteris, some of those we don't want to cut back until early in the spring and then we cut them all the way back to the ground. You can do that with Russian sage too or you can let it be a big hairy monster if you really want to. But right now we really just want to let those perennials stand, let them do their thing and then once spring comes around then we take that head trimmer to those ornamental grasses and go ahead and cut them back right before the new growth starts. Thanks to our panelists for their expertise in answering your questions. We'll, of course, hear more from them on our upcoming shows. We're going to end our show today by looking at an important topic that gardeners need to take seriously. Finding the correct chemical pesticide at the garden center is only the first step in controlling whatever is attacking your plants. Each product has specific instructions printed on the container that will ensure that your pests will be controlled without damaging the plant, polluting the environment, or harming animals. Here to help us take the mystery out of chemical labels is Backyard Farmer panelist Sarah Browning. So labels can be confusing and a little hard to understand. We're gonna help you figure that out today. So the first thing to understand is that the label on your pesticide product is a legal document. It's not a suggestion. You really need to follow the guidelines on the document because you're responsible for the applications you make or if there's any harmful effects when you're making a pesticide application. We're going to talk about how to protect yourself, how to protect your kids and pets, how to protect the environment, and how to make a good application so that you get control of the pest that you're trying to control. The first thing to look at on a label are the environmental hazard restrictions. Many pesticides are very toxic to fish and other aquatic wildlife. So most pesticides are going to have restrictions for applications to water or to areas where there's standing water, like ditches. It's also important to understand that you don't want to make an application just before there's a rain, because rain can easily move products off of the site and into surface water. And remember, water that goes into storm drains goes directly to surface water. Again, creeks, lakes, and streams. It doesn't go to a treatment plant. It's not treated in any way. So any pesticides or chemicals that are pulled off of the landscape in rainwater and runoff go directly to surface water and can cause fish kills and other adverse effects. It's also important to minimize drift when you're making applications. And so look for weather conditions on the day that you want to spray. The wind speed should be between 3 to 10 miles per hour and no higher to prevent drift and particles from moving off of your landscape onto uh, adjacent properties. Also, another good way to minimize drift is to make sure that the tip of the nozzle when you're making a liquid application is very close to the plant material that you're spraying and not farther up in the air. Another way to protect the environment when you're making applications is to minimize the total amount of product that you're using. So if you have a few dandelions in your lawn that you need to kill, make spot applications to those specific dandelions and don't do a broadcast application over the whole lawn. You're really going to minimize the amount of a, a product that you put out into the environment when you make spot applications. So it's going to save you time and money and help protect the environment. 
We also want to make sure that we protect bees when we're making any type of pesticide application. In fact, many products now have specific restrictions on the label which give you guidelines on how to protect pollinators. These include when you make the application, not making application to blooming plants, and then also some plant species are completely restricted. For this imidacloprid product, no applications can be made to linden, basswood, or any tree in the tilia species because the flowers that those trees produce are very, very attractive to bees, and bees can pick up the chemical through the nectar and the pollen that they eat, as well as through direct application um, over their bodies if you're making a contact application. So you also need to think about how to protect yourself when you're making an application. And the most important thing to look for on the product label is personal protective equipment. So what do you need to wear to protect yourself when you're making an application? Typically, you're going to need to wear a long sleeve shirt, long legged pants, shoes and socks, and chemical resistant gloves. But if, but if additional restrictions are on the label for eyewear, uh, be sure to follow all of those guidelines. Also look at the label to see if there's a certain amount of time that has to pass before people can go, people or pets can go back onto the treated area again. This is called a restricted entry interval. And oftentimes with a lot of homeowner labels, the restriction is to keep people and pets off the area until the product has dried. Pesticide labels contain a lot of information and it's really important that you read and understand all of the information before you make an application. And remember, pesticide labels change from time to time. So even if you've used a product in the past, before you use the new product that you purchased, read the label again, see if there's any changes and follow all the guidelines that are listed on that label. The label will help you understand application techniques, the correct amount and the frequency of application. Following those label instructions isn't just a good idea, it is the law. So thanks again for joining us for Lifestyle Gardening. Next time we will be visiting a school that encourages kids to get into gardening and we will check out more garden trends. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. So good morning, good gardening, thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening.